Welcome to the Prophecy Club. Our topic today is what's wrong with the pre-trib rapture. Yes, I know there's all kinds of things going on in the world, but this is the thing that God has laid on my heart to talk about today. What's wrong with the pre-trib rapture? Now, I, I'm gonna I, I want to make a deal with you. I went to lunch with one of my very best friends and also one of our congregation members and somebody else, I guess there's about two people who've come to me privately and said, Stan, would you please not make fun of us pre-tribbers on your program? I said, fair enough. Okay, so here's the three things I ask in return. One is that you patiently listen to me explain how the end really happens and with an open mind because I want you to switch from seeing a pre-trib rapture that is just not coming, it's just not in the scriptures, and I will fail in my job if I don't help you to see that. Second, I ask you to stop telling other people that they're going to be raptured and that they aren't going to have to go through any trouble. Third thing, I want you to understand that you, pushing a pre-trib rapture, will be causing some Christians to fall away from Christ. You will be causing some of those that have accepted Christ to lose their salvation. I want you to understand that. Oh, Stan, oh, come on. That, that's very harsh. That's, I mean, that's offensive. That's, I mean, you got scripture for that? Well, sort of. Here it is. This is what, what got me on this today. So I ran across this YouTube out there. As you can see, I have removed the name because I'm not trying to attack him. Uh, if it says, it is time, rapture, prophetic word included, Harpazo at any moment. Now, I want you to look in the purple, or excuse me, the, the, the pink. God has promised. That's what the pre-tribbers teach. God has promised us that we're not going to have to go through any trouble. Did he promise us? Actually, no. He didn't promise us. And so when people are taught that, I mean, they don't want to have to get into the Bible. They don't want to have to get into any of the detailed stuff. They're not going to take the time to research it for themselves. Okay, well, that's good enough for me. Okay, if you say God has promised us, we won't have to go and think. All right, then what happens when the trouble arrives? God lied to them. Do you see the problem? Okay, even if you're believing in pre-trib, I want you to patiently keep an open mind and look. Do you see a problem when people are promised? God has promised them that they're not going to go through any trouble. Then all of a sudden, they find themselves in trouble. Wait a minute. God lied to me. Can you see where they're going to walk away from the Christian faith? What little faith they may have, and that may be very little. Or maybe people that were thinking about accepting this Jesus. Now, no, 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 no. I done heard about that Jesus guy. He's a liar. He promised people that they'd be sucked out of here, and they're not going to go through any trouble, and here they are in it. Do you see the problem? Now, I'm going to show you something that's rather startling. In 1871, Albert Pike received a vision. Who's Albert Pike? Albert Pike wrote the book, Morals and Dogma. And on the front of it, it has Ordo Ab Chao. He is probably, if not the most evil, one of the most evil people that has ever lived. He started the Freemasons. He started a lot of satanic and evil stuff. Really, really evil guy. So he was shown a vision. Yeah, I guess Lucifer can give visions too. And he says, the first world war must be brought about in order to prevent the Illuminati. Okay, that's the 13 Illuminati bloodlines, the 13 families. As Jesus selected 12 apostles, the devil selected 13 families that he would use to put forth his gospel. The Illuminati to overthrow the power of the Tsars in Russia. So World War I was planned back in 1871 with the objective to overthrow Russia, the Tsars in Russia, okay? The Tsars of Russia and making that country a fortress of atheist, atheistic communism. Okay, is that true? That happened? Yep. It happened, came to pass. The divergencies caused by the agents of the Illuminati between the British and the Germanic empires. Okay, was World War I between Britain and Germany? Yes, it was. Will be used to foment this war, and at the end of the war, communism will be built, 
and used to destroy the other governments and in order to weaken the religions. So Russia was started, the overthrow of the Tsars, which were actually Christians, overthrew the Christian religion in order to raise up the Antichrist religion. That's the purpose and the point of Russia. The Second World War must be fomented by taking advantages of the differences between the fascists, that would be Germany, and the political Zionists, that would be the Jews. Okay, so World War II. Was World War II between Germany and the Jews? <laughs> yes, yes it was. This war must be brought about so that Nazism is destroyed. It was, <laughs> well, until Ukraine came along destroyed, and that political Zionism be strong enough to institute a sovereign state of Israel and Palestine. This is 1871, and they're planning the start of the state of Israel. Uh, obviously, Lucifer put forth his plans, such as God does too. During the Second World War, international communism must become strong enough in order to balance Christendom. Did that happen? That did happen. So, communism is the exact opposite of Christianity. So, when they're talking about the differences between communism and conservatism, no, 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 it's not conservatism. Where Fox News, which I think is a very big culprit, a very big problem with all of this, does is they talk about, they refuse to say things like Christians, okay? It's not between communism and conservatives, it's communism and Christianity, and that's the way it needs to be put forth. In order to balance Christendom, which would then be restrained and held in check, Christendom would be restrained and held in check until the time they would need it for the final social cataclysm. So, Christianity is going to be needed all the way to the end time. Why? For the final social cataclysm. What is that? That would be Armageddon, okay? After the Second World War, communism was, in fact, made strong and overcame weaker governments. In 1945, at the Potsdam Conference between Truman, Churchill, and Stalin, a large portion of Europe was given to Russia, and communism moved into China. The Third World War, now we're talking about the future, must be fomented by taking advantages of the differences caused between the agents of the Illuminati, between the Jews or the Zionists and the leaders of the Islamic world or Muslims. What's that saying? It's saying that the Molochs, the in Illuminati, are going to start a war between the Muslims and the Jews, and it's going to conclude at Armageddon. The war must be conducted in such a way that Islam and political Zionism mutually destroy each other. Meanwhile, the other nations, once more divided on this issue, will be constrained to find to the point of complete physical, moral, spiritual, and economical exhaustion. Now, here comes the big important part. We shall unleash the nihilists, that's the anarchists, those are the people that we saw up in Portland and such places, burning and looting and breaking windows and things like that. They release those people. Nihilists, anarchists, rebels, and the atheists and we shall provoke a formidable social cataclysm, which in all its horror will show clearly the nations the effect of absolute atheism. In other words, you've got to have a God. You can't have a society that does not have a God. You've got to see that. That's where they're going. Origin of savagery. Of the, hey, let me back up. Show clearly the nations the effect of absolute atheism, the origin of savagery, and the bloodiest turmoil then everywhere the citizens obliged to defend themselves against the world of minor, minority of revolutionaries will then exterminate those destroyers of civilization. Then the multitude, now disillusioned with Christianity, disillusioned with Christianity? Why would they be disillusioned with Christianity? I mean, Jesus keeps his promises, right? He does what he says he's going to do. Jesus is not a man that can lie. He must tell the truth, except, except that pre-trib rapture. Oh, he lied about that. Do you see a problem? I see a problem. All of these people that are promising people they're not going to have to go through trouble. When a great earthquake hits, what are they going to say? When suitcase nukes go off, 
what are they going to say? When the dollar is blowing worthless as leaves in the wind, what are they going to say? Michael Baldea said, if they only beat the pastors and burn the churches, they will have got off easily. I agree. I think the pre-trib rapture is going to turn out, when this whole world is over, it's going to turn out to be one of the biggest lies that the devil is most proud of. Shame on you people that teach it. I'm going to show you the truth. Now, if you don't want to believe it, and I understand the flesh part of us doesn't want to believe it. I understand that. I know that. I used to believe in teaching a pre-trib rapture too. Until one day, Gene Bacon, a prophet of God, showed me. When I saw it in the scriptures, I turned just like that. And I'm going to show you the scriptures. <laughs> I've already showed you lots of different ways. I'm going to show you. I'm going to give you reason today to turn and walk away of a pre-trib rapture. Let's go on. And the multitude disillusioned with Christianity, whose deistic spirits, in other words, they're used to having a God and a belief in God, deistic spirits will from that moment be without compass or direction. What? See, when they finally discover that Jesus is really a liar, that's what they're going to discover. Jesus is really a liar. Does that bother you to think that people that you taught are going to call Jesus a liar? It should. I'm not making fun of you. I'm digging into your heart. I'm trying to open your eyes. Christians that believe in it or teach a pre-trib rapture, I'm not making fun of you. This is bothering you because it's the truth. If it weren't the truth, it wouldn't be bothering you. Like I <laughs> was talking with a good friend of mine. He says, I hope that doesn't offend you. And I said, look, you know, I'm, I'm like the boss that says, I don't get ulcers, I give them. Okay? Uh, the post-trib people do not get bothered by pre-trib people. The pre-trib people, the ones that are carrying an error, those are the ones that get bothered by the post-tribbers. Okay, let's go on. The multitude disillusioned with Christianity, whose deistic... This is from the devil. This is his plan. And the multitude disillusioned with Christianity whose deistic spirits will from that moment be without compass or direction, anxious for an ideal or anxious for a God to believe in, but without knowing where to render its adoration, here you go, will receive the true light from the universal manifestation of the pure doctrine of Lucifer. Brought finally out into the public view, this manifestation will result from the general reactionary movement which will follow the destruction of Christianity and atheism, both conquered and exterminated at the same time. Wait, 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 wait. Why would the devil want to destroy atheism? I mean, th those are the people that don't believe in God. Why, why would he want to destroy that? Because he wants everyone to worship him. Atheists don't worship a God. Christians don't worship another God. So we got to get rid of both Christians and atheists or convert them to worshiping the devil, the Antichrist. Now, you see? All right, now, with that in mind, you said you'd keep an open mind. Let me show you. My point is, pre-trib doctrine is of the devil. It will be used to destroy Christianity. It will cause many, but not all, many Christians to lose faith and turn away from Christ, and they will turn to the Antichrist. This was on the Internet, Someone is now writing a letter to the people that don't get pulled up in the rapture. This is the letter. I started reading the letter. And because it has a name on it, I'm not going to say some bad things about it because I don't want to talk bad about another Christian. But it does say, I'm among others. If I just happen to be gone, and then it goes down to say, it is hard for me to conceive of the rapture actually happening. And it sounds completely bizarre. Well, I'll agree. It's because it doesn't happen that way. And it is bizarre. Here's another person put on their website, just a few more weary days and then we'll fly away. Jesus is a liar, don't you know? Because I said he was gonna, we were going to fly away and we didn't. No, Jesus is not a liar. You didn't do your studies. You didn't dig it out of the scriptures. Or when someone was trying to tell you, you wouldn't listen. 
So you, see, I'm not going to say anything bad. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything bad. It's hard because I want you to understand. All right, let's move on here. So I pulled this off of a guy talking, and this is his uh, theory of how this works. And we're going to talk about it today. So if you zoom in to this part right here, here's what he's saying. He's saying that the rapture happens here. Then we go to the marriage supper of the Lamb where Jesus serves us for seven years. At the end of the seven years, then Jesus returns and we return with him. That's what almost all of the pre-tribbers believe. So what's wrong with that? Well, there's a couple of things wrong with that. Anytime a prophecy teacher leaves out the feasts, run. Because obviously they don't really understand how the end time pattern works because the feasts are the pattern of the last days. So the marriage does not take place on the Feast of Trumpets because if he returns on trumpets and if the tribulation is seven years, as they say, then he who would, it, the, 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 the marriage supper would have to take place on the, marriage, on, on the Feast of Trumpets. It doesn't. I'm going to show you. Okay, so Yes, Jesus returns on the Feast of Trumpets, I agree. But the marriage does not take place on the Feast of Trumpets. So how do you know that? Well, that's a good question. Now, first of all, let me show you how it really happens. That way you'll understand it when I show you in the scriptures. So the next time, this is the, okay, we have Passover, Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, Pentecost, Trumpets, Atonement, and Tabernacles. And if you not, have not taken time in Leviticus 23 to study those, shame on you. You're not going to understand this. I can tell you right now, mm, it's going to fly right over your head. And because you don't understand the feasts, because you've not taken time to study and research the feasts, you will not see what I'm about to explain to you. And I can tell you, I have talked to many a group. I talked to a group of pastors. And it was like I was speaking Greek. They did not understand because they'd never taken the time to study the feasts. But the more you know the feasts, the more this is going to cause bells to ring. You say, oh, of course. So, <laughs> Jesus fulfilled Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits when he arose from the dead, right? Okay. The next time, by the way, when he arose, prophetic time stopped, okay? It starts again when he returns again on the Feast of First Fruits. That's when he comes down in a lamb body. Let me back up to that scripture. You remember Acts 1.11 says, You men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go. Okay, so when Jesus went up into heaven, how did he go up? Well, he just had fish with the disciples. He left in a lamb body where you could feel the nail scars, you could feel the sword where it went in. Remember Thomas, okay? And he left in normal clothes, a normal lamb body, probably still had the blood on him. What this is saying is the next time he comes back, I'll show you, the next time he comes back, he will come down in the same body, not king of kings and lord of lords. He will come as a lamb. Stand, do you have scripture on that? Yes, I do. I'll get to it. Let me back up. Okay, so the next time Jesus returns, he returns on first fruits in a lamb body. He resurrects 144,000. I've got a book on this called The Secret Door to Understand Bible Prophecy. Prophecyclub.com, you can get it. First fruits. He resurrects 144,000 one year old Jewish boys. Well, where do you get 100? Okay, that book explains it. Can't go into that or get me off my topic. They walk around for 50 days. Exactly 50 days later, on Pentecost, we go to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And about four months later, we return with him behind him on white horses for Armageddon. Now, that's the brief way it, it's... Okay, so he returns here. Rex Rex, 144,000, walks around 50 days. We go to the marriage supper of the Lamb. About four months later, we return right here. Now, that's the simple way. Now, let's dig into some of the scriptures. First fruits. He returns on Mount Zion, resurrects 144,000. Fifty days later, exactly, Pentecost, we go to the marriage supper. And then about four months later, we go to trumpets. We return with him as his saints. You got scripture on that? Yes, I do. 
This is the scripture that none of the pre-tribbers, either they don't look at it, they don't understand it, or <laughs> they just jump over it. But this is the one that tears up their, their theory of a pre-trib. Revelation 14, 1. I looked and lo, a lamb. Well, what's wrong with that? Well, the problem is the pre-tribbers believe he returns on the Feast of Trumpets as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But here's a scripture that says he returns as a lamb. The pre-tribbers know that Zechariah 14 says when he returns, he sets his feet down on the Mount of Olives. And that's Armageddon. And I agree with that. But they don't account for him coming down. Here it is. A lamb stood upon the Mount Zion. Okay, so what are you going to do with that? How's that fit in? The answer is it doesn't fit into a pre-trib rapture. Well, then just take the verse out of the Bible. Wrong. Because your understanding is wrong because you haven't taken the time to study it. Again, I've got a book, Secret Door to Understand Bible Prophecy. It lays all this out with all the charts and maps and everything so you can understand it. I, I looked and lo, a lamb stood upon the Mount Zion. Mount Zion is about a 30-minute walk from Mount of Olives. So when Jesus returns the next time, it's to Mount Zion, resurrects 144,000 one-year-old Jewish boys. Then it's about a 30-minute walk, but he didn't walk. He goes back up. Actually, he walks all over for 50 days. Probably walks up to the Mount of Olives. But the next time he returns is the Mount of Olives. This is for Armageddon. He returns with his saints. This is about four months away. So the next time he returns is the Mount Zion. Pre-tribbers can't account for that. That messes up their theory because their theory is wrong. You can't just leave out a verse here or there and just decide that you're going to pick and choose to make it fit what you want to fit, okay? He returns here on Mount Zion for first fruits. Four months later, he returns on Mount of Olives. All right, now let's go back. I looked and lo, a lamb stood upon the Mount Zion, with him 144,000 having his father's name written on their foreheads. Now I'm going to skip the next three verses. I'm going to get down to, these were they which follow the lamb whithersoever, that is the 144,000, follow the lamb whithersoever he goeth, these are they which followed them. Was, these were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God. Okay, wait a minute, wait a minute, hold, hold on. First fruits unto God. What does that mean? It means that A, they arose on first fruits, and B, they are the first ones to come out of the grave for some 2,000 plus years since Jesus came out of the grave. They do not get their glorified body because no one gets that until trumpets. Because at this point, Jesus is not King of kings and Lord of lords. Nobody has it yet, including him. He doesn't get glorified. He doesn't get his glorified, but he doesn't become King of kings and Lord of lords till he goes to the marriage supper lamb. That is the coronation or the crowning of the king. I'll get to that. And by the way, I can already see him going along, but I'm going to keep going. I, I've got this on my heart. I've, I've got to share it. Hope, again, hopefully you'll stick with me. I'll explain it. I, it'll just take some time, though. Okay, so being the first fruits unto God and the Lamb, these are the first ones, the 144,000. They're the first ones to get their resurrected body not glorified yet. I do not know whether they're resurrected to a baby or to mature bodies, but Leviticus 23:10, I believe it is, tells what is required in the sacrifice. And in this sacrifice, it's a he lamb without blemish of the first year. So all of these 144,000 one-year-old Jewish boys had all die in their first year. It goes on to say, being the first fruits unto God and the Lamb, that, that is the secret door that ties the first fruits from the feasts to the first fruits right here. That is the secret door. And in their mouth is found no guile, for they are without fault before, before the throne of God. Okay, how do you have no guile in your mouth? Maybe it's because they were in their first year and they never learned to talk. And they have no fault before the throne of God because they were in their first year and they never sinned. Does that make sense? So these 144,000 one-year-old Jewish boys are resurrected. Now, let's go to the next one. In first fruits, these are the first to come out of the grave since the first fruits. These are the first to get their new, not glorified, but a resurrected body. And they came out of the grave on first fruits. Those are the points I'm trying to make. Then we've already read this, so I'll move on. Oh, I do want to point out, he left in a lamb body. He returns on first fruits in a lamb body. This says, as he left, he returns the same way, okay? And he left 
uh, on first fruits, he returns on first fruits. He left in a lamb body, he returns in a lamb body. That's the point I'm trying to make. He goes to the marriage supper of the lamb, crowned king of kings, Lord. Okay, all right. Now, what feast is the marriage supper of the lamb? This is another thing that's about to destroy pre trib rapture. Because if there's a pre trib rapture, and there's not. And if the tribulation lasts seven years, and it does, that means that the same day it ends on also be, has to be the same day it starts on. And now, it officially ends on atonement, but for us, because we get our glorified body, for us, it ends on Armageddon, when, Jesus, when we return with Jesus riding white horses. So let me explain. When does the marriage supper of the Lamb? What is the marriage supper? This is Daniel 7. I saw the Son of Man come with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, that's the Father, and brought him near before him and has given him dominion, glory, and a kingdom, that all people, nations, languages shall serve and obey him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is that which shall not be destroyed. That's a picture of Jesus going to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, when does the marriage supper of the Lamb take place? Exodus 19.1 tells us. In the third month, when the children of Israel, blah, blah, blah. And this is when God says, in verse 4, You've seen what I did to the Egyptians. I brought you out on eagles' wings to myself. Next verse says, You'll be a particular treasure above all people. You'll be a kingdom priest, a holy nation. So he's saying, I will be your God if you will be my people. In other words, I will be your husband if you will be my wife. That's what he's saying. And... The, it says, all that the Lord hath spoken, we will do. And I believe that word right there for do is where we get the answer to it. Do you, do you uh, accept this woman to be your lawfully wedded wife? And the man says, I do. Because that was the first marriage. Now, when is that? Well, if you study the feasts, you know that there's only one feast in the third month, and that is Pentecost. So the first marriage in the world took place on Pentecost, and the last marriage takes place on Pentecost. What does that mean? That means we go to the marriage supper of the Lamb on a Pentecost, not the Feast of Trumpets. So it's another thing pointing to the fact that people that think of a pre tree of rapture, just they've missed it because they don't understand the feast. The only feast in the third month is Pentecost. So the first and last marriage occurs on Pentecost. Remember Jesus said, there are four months and then the harvest. What's he talking about? I believe this is what he's talking about. There's four months between Pentecost and trumpets. When he says there's four months because we go to the marriage supper of the Lamb, this is where he is receiving many crowns, a vesture dipped in blood and a white horse. We do not get anything except a wedding garment. Four months later, we get a white horse to return with him. This is the wedding, gar the, we get a wedding garment, a white horse, Jesus is crowned King of kings and Lord of lords. This is where Jesus gets glorified. Then on the way back, he glorifies all of us. Okay, now let me explain the difference between Mount Zion and the Mount of Olives. First of all, what you're looking at is the next time Jesus returns, he will turn to the Mount of Zion. So, so I've been there, I've been on top of it, been to the Mount of Olives, okay? And Mount Zion is a pretty small mountain. You can walk up there. It's not a problem. But <laughs> getting 144,000 one-year-old Jews up there, they're going to be crowded. That's the reason they follow the Lamb with us wherever he goeth. He walks all over Jerusalem. And this is when the angel is flying through the midst of the year, having the everlasting gospel preach them the earth, that dwell on the earth, saying them dwell on the earth. They should make, uh, they should uh, worship him that made heaven and the earth and the fountains of water and all of that. Because the marriage of the Lamb is about to take place. If you want to go to the marriage, you don't want to have to go through those last four months, which is real hell, then here's your chance. Now, that's not a pre-trib. That's not a mid-trib. I'm not even saying that's a pre-wrath rapture because at this time, this is six and three quarters into a seven-year tribulation. At this point, most Christians are dead anyway. Uh, the Mark of the Beast has been going on for over three years. Most Christians at this point are already dead. I'm not calling that a rapture because the definition of a rapture is avoiding trouble. I think it is prior to the tribulation, or excuse me, prior to Armageddon. Okay, so anyway, the next time Jesus returns, he returns here to Mount of Olives, resurrects 144,000. About four months later, which is about a 30-minute walk, then he re returns out here to the Mount of Olives. 
pre-tribbers will all agree. Okay, I'll agree. I mean, <laughs> when Jesus returns the last time, he doesn't come down to Mount Zion. He comes to Mount of Olives, Zechariah 14. No question. All right, well, let, let me see where it says. Okay, let's go to Zechariah 14. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh. The day of the Lord is the day that Jesus returns. We get our glorified body, our mantles, our crowns, our rewards. All of our sin is washed away. And for us, on that day, eternity begins. I will gather all nations against Jerusalem in battle. That's the battle of Armageddon. The Lord go forth and fight against those nations. His feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. <laughs> there it is. So it's the Mount of Olives. And the Lord my God shall come and all the saints with thee. So this is when our Mount of Olives takes place. This is when Jesus returns. The Lord my God shall call and come with all of his saints. So this is essentially saying this. My summarized version. The day of the Lord gathers all nations to attack Jerusalem. He fights those nations. His, he stands upon the Mount of Olives. All of the saints are with him. That's the Feast of Trumpets. So if the pre-trib is true, the tribulation would have to start on the Feast of Trumpets, and it doesn't. The marriage supper of the Lamb would have to start on the, marriage, uh, on the Feast of Pentecost, excuse me, on the Feast of Trumpets. It doesn't. It starts on the Feast of Pentecost. So I can show you this. Let me go back to, well, maybe this one. So Jesus returns again on first fruits, resurrects 144,000. Fifty days later, we all, dead or alive, in Christ, that are ready, not everybody. That's the reason it says, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord henceforth, yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from the labors and their, and their works do follow them. So they still get all of their works, but they weren't ready. So they didn't get to go to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Here's another thing. I've heard people say, well, all Christians are the bride of Christ. No, that's not true. If you didn't go to the marriage, how can you be the bride? Let me ask you again. <laughs> if you didn't go to the marriage, how can you be the bride? The only ones that are the bride of Christ are those that are ready that get to go to the marriage supper of the Lamb, right? Okay. So, Jesus returns first fruits, 144,000 resurrected, then the wheat, that's us, go to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Four months later, we return with Jesus, and we now have our glorified bodies as Jesus has his glorified body, and we return. We do not work at all. We do not destroy anything. Jesus and the two angels with sharp sickles destroy them all. Okay, now, uh, let me jump back to this. Okay, so this guy here is saying that the rapture takes place here and then Jesus returns back here. It's just not correct. That's what the flesh wants to believe, but it's just not correct. But down here he has the spring feasts and the fall feasts, but he does not put them into the pattern. So how do we know the saints return with Jesus in Armageddon, which is the last trump, the seventh trump? The discussion back in those days, these scriptures, was not talking about can we avoid the tribulation. At that time, John, the revelator on the island of Patmos, hadn't even been given the book of Revelation. How can they be expected to be Jesus, tell, or actually the, the prophet or the, the, the apostle here, was telling them that they're going to avoid the tribulation. They didn't even know there was going to be a tribulation. They're not talking about the tribulation. What are they talking about? Here, it tells you. 1 Thessalonians 4.13, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning, what is it, what is it? Concerning them which are asleep. That's what he's talking about. In other words, the people apparently were asking the apostle, say, look, you know, what, what about the people that aren't alive when Jesus returns? What happens to them? So he's answering them even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so then which are also asleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord that we are alive and remain, and that the coming of the Lord shall not prevent, as in we will not, we will not come out first. We do not get our glorified bodies first. Actually, whether you're in the grave, out of the grave, wherever you are, as that morning star hits you, we all get our glorified body, all of our mantles, our rewards, our crowns, everything in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. So we will not prevent or we will not, it will not be a pre-event altogether. For the Lord himself should descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. I wish that it had said the seventh trump. 
It would have made it so much easier. The trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Okay, fine. So the dead in Christ rise up, but when that glory hits, it hits the whole earth. It goes to the center of the earth. That, that's called the morning star. It goes to the center of the earth, sets the foundations of the mountains on fire. The channels of the sea are seen. The hills melt like wax at the presence of the Lord. All of the tears fall to the ground, a pile of ashes and bones. And that's the reason they take no wood out of the, 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 the take no wood out of the forest for seven years <laughs> because they're because of all of the bones they're burying. Seven months they bury the bones. Right? Uh, Ezekiel thirty and thirty nine. Okay, well, anyway. then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. That's not white cumulus clouds. Those are dark clouds and thick darkness because eternity is darkness. All right. Comfort one another with their, comfort one another with these words. Well, how's that comfort? Because he's they're not talking about the tribulation. They don't know about the tribulation. They don't they haven't got the book of Revelation yet. They don't know there's a seven year tribulation coming. To them, it's comfort because they're saying, look at the people that have already died, they're gonna get saved too. That was the whole point he was trying to make. Now let's go to the next one. Flesh can't get the new glorified body. That's the point he's trying to make once again. 1 Corinthians, they did not know about Revelation yet. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. That's the point. He's trying to say, look, it. if you want to get the new wine, you have to have a new wine skin. He's not going to glorify this body of flesh and blood. We get a new light body. As, the, as that glory, as that morning star hits us, out of our belly, belly flows rivers of living water. And just that quick, we get our glorified body, our mantles, our crowns, rewards, everybody. And what gives us eternal life to all of the sinners, it turns them to, destroys both body and soul, turns to piles of ashes and bones. Flesh and blood cannot enter the kingdom of God, neither does corruption enter interrupt, in, in corruption. I show you, Mr. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In other words, not all of the Christians die <clears throat> in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye at the last or the seventh trump. That fits with all the scriptures too. For the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall all be changed. Changed into a glorified body. He's not talking about getting to skip the tribulation. They don't know about the tribulation. For this corruption must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. Because when that morning star hits us, for that, for us, it is eternity. That's the reason it says death is now swallowed up in victory got a couple more scriptures I want to cover with you. <clears throat> Luke 21, 36. A lot of people think, oh, this is guaranteeing us that we get to skip the tribulation. Wrong again. Again, they don't know about the tribulation. Revelation hasn't been given. So, watch ye therefore and pray always that you might be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Now, the key word to understand that verse is the word stand. Remember the word stand. And heaven departed as a scroll when it was rolled together. That's Jesus. That is eternity entering into time. And as eternity enters into time, the heaven rolls back like a scroll. And that's the reason they're not white clouds. They're clouds of thick darkness and gloominess and, 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 and thick darkness because Jesus' eternity is darkness. And he is the light that overcomes all of the darkness. So the heaven departs like a scroll. Every mountain and island moved out of the places. The kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the chief captains, mighty men, every bond man, free man, hid themselves in the dens and the rocks and the mountains and cried to the mountains and rocks and said, Hide us from the face of him that sateth upon the throne. What just happened? They just saw Jesus come down. They just saw the heavens roll back like a scroll because the the windows of heaven are now open. Like Stephen being stoned, he looked up and he saw the windows of heaven open. When God hit Sodom and Gomorrah, he opened the windows of heaven and poured out sulfur upon the five cities. <clears throat> Hide us from the face of him that sat upon the throne and for the wrath of the Lamb. That's another verse that says the tribulation is not the wrath of God. The wrath of God is the morning star in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. That's the wrath of God. For the great day of his wrath is coming, who should be able to stand? Meaning, if you make it through the burning, and some people's works will be burned up. Remember that scripture? Okay. 
So if you make it through the burning, if you are left standing, then that's what he's saying, that you can escape the burning, not escape the tribulation. <coughs> Let me back up. Watch ye therefore and pray always that you might be accounted worthy to escape the burning and stand before the Son of Man. That's what he's saying. So that verse is not guaranteeing you escape anything. So I ask you to stick with me through the end. If you stuck with me through the end, as a matter of fact, I've got a book called Miss the Mark, and it explains this, but Secret Door to Understand Bible Prophecy does not have the word rapture in it. I specifically did not talk about the rapture. Why? Because I wanted people that believe in a pre-trib rapture to not be offended and read the book. But as they read the book and as they begin to understand the pattern of how the end times really plays out, I won't have to tell them that there's not a pre-trib, not a mid-trib. There's not a time ever when Jesus is going to suck anybody into the sky so they don't have to be tested. We all have to be tested. I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open. And another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged dead of those things written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave it the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man according to his works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire, this is the second death, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life is cast into the lake of fire. Everyone is judged. Everyone is tested. There is no escape of the testing. Everybody's tested, and everybody receives the rewards according to those things done in the body. Now, if you got Jesus there as your advocate washing your sins away, you're in a whole lot better shape than those that did not hear of Jesus before Jesus. So, no, there's not a time when Jesus is going to return in the sky, suck somebody in the air so they don't have to go through any trouble. It's just not going to happen. It's a lie from the pit of hell. I urge you to throw away the pre-trib, the mid-trib, any kind of a guarantee you're not going to be tested. Look, what are you going to do when an earthquake opens up America from the Great Lakes all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico? and you thought there was going to be pre-trib rapture. What are you going to do when some 35 suitcase nukes go off all across America all in the same day? And you were told that you won't see any trouble. Or you told other people, or you taught people that there's not going to be any trouble. What are you going to do? Well, I'll tell you what they're going to do. They're going to call you a liar. They're going to call Jesus a liar. They're going to throw away their Bible. They're going to burn their churches. I don't want to be in that. I'd rather my ministry not grow large because I was telling the truth, but I prefer my ministry go large because they discovered I was teaching them the truth and they didn't want to believe it. Ask Jesus to forgive your sins. Ask him into your heart. Ask him to be your God. Today, we live in unsettling times. Have you ever wondered what you're going to do when food is no longer on the shelves? I'm Leslie, owner and founder of Joseph's Kitchen, and I want to show you how to make healthy, homemade, whole wheat bread for only a few hundred dollars a year. At Joseph's Kitchen, our ingredients have been packaged for immediate use or long-term storage. Go to josephskitchen.com or call the number on your screen to order today. Don't get caught unprepared. Go to josephskitchen.com now. Terry Saka with CornerstoneAssetMetals.com. So what's going on in the world of finances? Why should they call today? Well, China has laid out in a speech a few weeks ago exactly what they think of the United States. I haven't seen that in my 55 years. With China and Russia forming these reserve currencies, new reserve currency, we better be prepared because that dollar is going to be in deep trouble and we're going to need assets to protect us from it. CornerstoneAssetMetals.com. Call them or go online, cornerstoneassetmetals.com, or call them at 888-747-3309. 888-747-3309. Next is, I'll send you to empshield.com. If you use the promo word prophecy, you get a $50 discount. What is that? Well, it looks like this. This is the one that goes into a car, okay? And you put the red wire to the red side of the battery. 
you put the black wire to the black side of the battery and the green one attaches to the body of the car. Then you peel it off right back here. Just peel that off, stick it inside of the, 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 the engine compartment of your car. And the whole point is when the electricity goes off or when some kind of a suitcase nuclear, or nuclear device goes off, this is supposed to be able to stop that device from destroying every computer chip in your car. Because if every computer chip is destroyed in your car these days, you couldn't possibly replace them all. Throw the car away. So, empshield.com, promo code PROPHECY.